So we'll go ahead and get started with some introductions and then go right into our first presentation. So we're going from Blackboard to the beyond uh, today for our session. So I am Heather Lorenz. I'm the Senior Digital Media Trainer at the School of Journalism. And in my day job, I teach our students video editing, animation, and all those things. Um, but I'm excited to kind of play a different role and bring some of our great professors and some of my friends here to help you get started for this unusual fall semester. So just to, I'm gonna introduce everyone and then we'll go get started. So our first presenters today are going to be Dr. Lisa McClendon, who is the News and Info Track Chair at the School of Journalism. And she's going to be ping-ponging back and forth with Dr. Peter Bobkowski, who is an Associate Professor at the School of Journalism as well. They will be followed by Doug Ward, who is the Associate Director for the Center for Teaching Excellence and an Associate Professor at the School of Journalism. Two hats, he wears them both well. Next, we have Dr. Amy Lyersoff. Okay, I like saying her name. Um, she's a program coordinator for the Institute for Leadership Studies. So I'm excited to have her here today. She's our special guest with the Journalism School. I like to think we've adopted her. And finally, we have Jerry Berenson, who is a lecturer with the School of Journalism. So guys, this is an all-star lineup. I'm so excited to bring all these folks here for you. Um, so that we can just teach you some wonderful things. So we're gonna get started with that blackboard portion and I'm going to have Peter and Lisa take over and they're gonna be pinging and ponging back and forth and we're gonna start with Peter who is going to talk to you about setting up in blackboard. Hi everyone, hope you're all doing well. Um, I actually recorded my, uh, I have two short tutorials that I recorded because I don't trust myself to do this fluidly live um, in front of all of you. So um, after a couple of words of introduction, Heather's just gonna press play and uh, play my short videos. And then I'm happy to answer any follow-up questions that you might have. The first tutorial is about how I set up uh, my Blackboard sites. Um, I do this in, I, my setup is chronological um, and I try to make it as simple and intuitive as possible, even though uh, you sort of have to wrestle Blackboard into submission to do that. Um, so I'll just let uh, Heather play the video and if you have any follow-up questions, happy to answer those. I imagine that students come into Blackboard either to see what they're supposed to be doing for a class and to work on that assignment or to check their grades. So the entry point for students in Journalism 302 is the current week and each week consists of a chronological list of all the tasks that students are expected to accomplish that week. If we were in the week of February 10th, and we were looking at this blackboard, this would be our landing page, and we would easily see that we had two readings, a reading quiz, a link to a slideshow, and an assignment that was due. On the side, I have links to the syllabus, our going virtual announcement from last semester, links to assignment instructions, and students' grades, and then a chronological list of all the weeks in the semester. Each of these links leads to a week space, just like this one, so students can easily navigate forward and backward in what's happening in the course. I'm going to switch to a blank blackboard and show you how I set up this chronology. The first thing I do is delete anything in the sidebar that I don't need. So I delete announcements and resources for building your course. Next, I use this plus sign to create items in the sidebar. A content area is the basic building block I use. So I select this first option. 
I will call the first content area syllabus. By default, these links in the sidebar are hidden from students when they're created, so I have to select show link. Now I will create a few more links for a few weeks. So week of August 24th, week of August 31st, week of September 7th, and so on. Normally I would keep going for the entire semester. I put this double colon at the beginning of each week to indent these links and help create a visual hierarchy in the sidebar. I could just as easily use a dash or a plus sign or another character at the beginning of each of these lines. I can also create a subheader and call it what's happening this week. and also a divider to place above this section. Whenever something is created, it appears at the very bottom of the list, so I have to move these elements in place. I can also create a header called Course Tools and put that in place. I can also create a direct link to our online textbook, so a web link, and paste the URL in here. And move that in place. The last thing I want to cover briefly is how I create content inside each week. So if we go to the first week of class, the four options I use here are either an item, which is just a description of something, a web link, that's usually a link to an online reading or a slideshow, and under assessments I use test for reading quizzes and assignment, which is what students use to turn in all of their written assignments. Let's say that I create a web link. Let's call it Read Chapter 1 for Wednesday. And I put in a URL. I type something in the description. Let's say, follow this link to read the first chapter of the Be Credible textbook. By default, this type is size 3, but I always change it to size 4 because I think that it's more legible that way. I will show you the difference. So I leave this as 3, and I'll copy this and set it as 4 in the next paragraph, and submit. I like much better how this second line appears in comparison to the first line. Like I said at the beginning, the entry point for my students, so the first thing that students see, is the current week. This has to be set manually each week, and that's under Customization, Teaching Style, and Entry Point. You can select any content area in the course as the entry point. These days I ask a GTA to change this every weekend, in the past, I would set up a reminder for myself to make the change once a week. Let's so as you can see, it's not, it's not magic, but um, hopefully that those few steps um, might be helpful for some of you. Excellent. Lisa, let's go ahead and have you talk about creating a banner inside of Blackboard. Okay, great. Um, this is something that is just a picture that goes at the top of um, your course entry point. As like Peter was saying, he reset the entry point. If you don't reset the entry point, if you have them land on a static page, you can put a picture at the top of that. Now, there's not really any pedagogical function to this. 
except it helps students distinguish between your course and the four or five other courses they are flipping among. And it just kind of helps it to stand out. So I'm going to show you a, an example or two of this. Um, this is my page for Journalism 419. Um, and I just put a cartoon at the top of it. Um, so, you know, I have a little joke here for my editing students. This is where they learn how to edit. Um, and this is on my announcements page. Um, and you need to, you need to have a pretty strongly horizontal image for your banner image. And you can use, you know, a comic strip, you can create an image in, you know, Photoshop or Spark or whatever graphics producer you choose. Um, but um, it just basically gives, gives your course a little bit of pop at the beginning um, at the, when, when the students enter the course. So it's like, oh yeah, this is editing. It's got a cartoon. Oh yeah, this is a different class. Um, I'll uh, show you my, um, this is our new class. Whoops, not that one. Sorry, I've got too many classes in here. <laughs> um, this is our new class for fall words at work. And I just created a very simple graphic in Adobe Spark that has the name of the class love, you know, sort of writing themed images in there. Again, just to sort of make this um, just a teensy bit more personal um, and welcoming for the students. Okay, so how do you add this? Um, Peter already showed you customization here in Blackboard, and this is another thing that you can find under teaching style. So if you go to teaching style, um, you scroll down past course entry point here. So this is where he set his course entry point. This is where you can set this. Um, you can set a couple of other things. Um, for those of you who have been here at KU for a while, you remember they used to like let you pick a color theme and everything, they got rid of that. So the banner image is really the only chance you have to kind of personalize your course. Um, so down here, when you have select banner, this is where you go. Um, now it says here, we recommend using a banner approximately 480 by 80 pixels. That is tiny. That shows up super small. Um, on your screen, and it may look better on, say, a phone or a tablet, but most students do not use Blackboard very effectively on a phone or a tablet, so I would say double that um, for using it because most of them are going to be logging on through an actual real computer. Um, so if you do it, say, you know, even if you want to go, say, like 1,000 by 200, that's probably good enough. Um, if you go any bigger, it will cut off or look wonky or, um, you know, otherwise get weird. Um, but yeah, if you have just a nice strip image, so what do you do? You, you, you find or create your image where it says attach file. You just browse your computer um, and, you know, your little window will pop up and it'll, you know, give you choices of, you know, what to pick. Um, click whatever you want. I always add the alt text, you know, for images that you're using on Blackboard, put the alt text there that um, allows screen readers to basically read out the content of the photo for students who are visually impaired. Um, it's just kind of a nice habit to get into, do it for your tweets, do it for your Blackboard images, that sort of thing. Um, and then just click, click submit and you're done with the banner image. It's actually a pretty simple process. Um, and, uh, you know, it can help make your course look just, just a little bit nicer. Thank you so much, Lisa. Um, we will now hop back to Peter, uh, who's going to talk about rubrics. Did you want to set that up, Peter, or should I play the video? Uh, no, not much to set up. Uh, just uh, the video starts with a tiny bit of context about why I use um, rubrics for every assignment and then walks you through uh, how I set up my rubrics. Several years ago, a committee of my peers ruled against me in a graduate student's grade appeal partly because I didn't use a rubric with a project the student was disputing. So from then on, I've made sure that I use a Blackboard rubric with every assignment I grade. Rubrics are located under Course Tools and Rubrics. A rubric is set up as a matrix with levels of achievement or proficiency across the top and the components of an assignment that are being graded on the left side. For each level of achievement, you get to assign a label and with how many points or percent that label corresponds. You can choose between a points rubric, points range, percent, and percent range. I use percent 
so that each row is out of 100%. If I used points, I would assign how many points each column or achievement level was worth, and I wouldn't have this percent weight on the side. Each row would just be worth a certain number of points. If I used the range option, I would put two numbers in each box showing a range of points or percent. Again, this is the percent option setup. I created these levels of achievement loosely based on KU grading scale definitions. I use missing, inadequate, does not meet expectations, meets expectations, above average, almost flawless and flawless. The numbers I, I use are in the middle of each letter grade. So 94 is A, 84 is B, 74 is C, and so on. And these numbers have to be entered in every row. You can add columns and move them around like this. Each row is an element of an assignment that will be graded. So here we grade the search process. Search is thorough and uses appropriate strategies. Search thinking process is explained well and so on. You can also add rows and move rows around. The weird thing is that when you click the move button, it seems like nothing happens. But in fact, a dialog box appears at the very bottom where you can move these categories up and down. In this percent setup, all the weights have to add up to 100. And Blackboard will remind you of this when you try to close out. You can assign each row's weight yourself or ask Blackboard to make each row be worth an equal percentage. The rubric has to be activated inside the assignment in the grading section. The number of points here can equal to however many points you want. 33, 20, 150, 200. It doesn't matter. They don't have to equal the rubric. The rubric will calculate a grade that corresponds to this point total. When I grade a student's assignment, I click on rubrics. The rubric grid appears and I can select each of the assignment levels. I can add comments if I want to. and then the rubric calculates an overall grade. Okay, we will now hop back over to Lisa who is going to add some discussion of weighting. So, Lisa. Okay, great. Um, one of the really nice things about Blackboard is it will calculate your grades for you. Um, which is if you don't want to mess with um, a lot of math and a lot of weighting, if you have um, a lot of assignments in your class. I mean, if you have, you know, three papers in a test, it's no big deal to calculate your grade. But if you have, you know, 50 quizzes and, you know, 30 assignments, it gets a little hairy sometimes. <laughs> um, and so you can uh, determine your weighting, you know, what I want quizzes worth this percentage and um, graded assignments worth this percentage and, you know, just sort of in class activities worth a certain percentage and, you know, participation or engagement or however you want to, you know, break it down however you want to break it down. That's fine. Um, and Blackboard can calculate all that for you. Um, uh, a couple of things that you do need to know about that you have to assign things to categories in the grading columns um, and you have to actually you know have your percentage determined on your syllabus which you probably already do um, so i will show you where to find that um, how to how to set up a weighted column here um, so you're going to need to um, 
actually, I'm going to go back to my other class because I've got a way to call them set up there. Alrighty. Um, so you go to the grade center, you go to your full grade center, go to create calculated column. Um, and then you'll have a weighted column here. Um, and what, you know, you'll have to name it. And I always call it something like your real grade because Blackboard keeps these weird, like total point kind of things. And it's like, okay, don't even look at that. I, you know, hide those from students if you can. Um, the nice thing about keeping a weighted total is that you will have zero students asking you, what grade am I getting in this class? Because it's right there. Um, so you give it a name, name it in the grade center, tell them what it is. Um, you can give them just a percent. I usually just give them a percentage and nothing else. Um, but this is where you assign things. Okay, so, okay, well, let's see, I've got assignments. And I'm gonna put that over here. You give the, click the little arrow and I'm gonna have, um, let's see, quizzes and that goes over here and I have a category that I call ungraded homework which is um, you know things that they do that's like credit no credit you know if you were here and you get the points if you weren't you don't kind of thing that's ungraded homework and then um, engagement eh, which is like participation okay so you get these columns over on the side um, and you can weight them um, so you, I can say, okay, well, I want quizzes worth 30% of my grade. And, and I want to drop the lowest grade of the quizzes. So you get a free pass if you blow a quiz or skip a quiz, boom. Okay, maybe I want my ungraded homework to be worth 20%. Maybe I want my engagement to be worth 10%. And then my assignments, that's you know the day-to-day -day homework to how you practice this. I want that worth the other 40%. Now, it's here. Okay, assignment 40%. Right down here, notice total weight 100%. Okay, now if I said, well, I want that worth 30%. I don't know why I did that. Okay. Um, it's going to tell me total weight is 90%. So I have made a math error here, and it will tell me that before I submit that. Um, so you're like, okay, wait a minute. Oh, wait, I did change that. I want that 40%. So woohoo, we've got that. And then you can submit it. Um, and you can calculate this as a running total. Okay, and so that means that you've got everything that you have graded so far goes into the weighting for this column. Okay, that means that, um, you know, it just, it automatically, maybe I want to, maybe I want to drop my lowest homework grade too. So give them a pass on that one too. Um, and you can drop, if you want to drop, I don't know why you would drop the highest, but you can. I'm oh, sorry, I thought somebody had a question. Um, you know, if you want to tell people, look, okay, you know, I know you're making progress through the semester. And so, um, you know, whatever grade you get on the final quiz, I will raise any of your grades lower than that to meet that grade. So you can use the highest value to calculate that if you want to. Um, I had a calculus teacher in college who did that and I was eternally grateful. <laughs> that saved me from like, getting a C minus in calculus uh, because the final exam, if you got lower, it erased your grade. So um, you may want to do that. You may not, you can leave that alone. Um, Quizzes you can weight equally or proportionally. Okay, if you have some quizzes that are worth 10 points and some quizzes that are worth 40 points, you probably want to weight them proportionally. Okay, if you have quizzes that some weeks they're worth nine points and some weeks they're worth 12 points and it's, it's just pretty much a weekly quiz, you can just decide to count them all the same and weight them equally. But do make sure that if you want the higher point quizzes to count for more weight, you weight them proportionally. Um, same thing with assignments here. You know, if you have some that are worth 10 points and some that are worth 50 points, weight them, the, calc the Blackboard will calculate them either direction. It gives you that choice to do that. Um, so that is where you do that. I'm going to cancel this one. Um, I guess I didn't need to really have a class in there to show you um, how to do that. But I will tell you one other thing. If you manage your column organization here, you probably already know how to do this and you can move these things around and everything. This is a way that lets you check though. Okay, I've got everything in the proper quiz category. Um, some of these things, these don't count. I've got ungraded homeworks. I've got engagement, assignment, assignment, you know, ungraded homework. These are all graded assignments. So, um, you know, you can do a very quick check to make sure your grades are assigned to the proper category. And that means you don't have to look at each one individually. You can just kind of run down the list and look. Um, and the nice thing you can do is you can put the your real grade <laughs> weighted frozen. You can drag it down here or up here and everything above this line is frozen. That means 
that they can always, that is always visible to them first um, and always visible to you first. <laughs> um, so um, you're, you're not scrolling back and forth to, you know, to see where that is. And see, here's the points possible, 35.8. I don't even know where the, that number comes from because there's like a thousand points in my class or something. I have no idea what this number is, but there's a column with it. So I try to hide that one. <laughs> um, but that's something that can be really useful with, uh, with grade weighting. And I think I've got one other thing to show you, um, and that is adaptive release. Um, Adaptive release basically just lets you hold on to stuff being closed until students have reached a certain point of something. Um, and so I will show you um, an example. Actually, a lot of examples of that is, um, for now, the, the School of Journalism has an online uh, grammar class. It's, uh, it's not for credit, no, you don't have to pay for it, you don't get a grade in it, but students have to pass it before they can enter our media writing class. Um, and it is self-paced and it's entirely like auto-graded and everything because there's like 400 people enrolled in it at any one time and it's just too much to, to manage otherwise. Um, but uh, it's all built with adaptive release because it, students need to move through it and they can't just like jump to the end. They have to like move through and finish things before the other things open and then they can keep moving. It, basically adaptive release lets you keep students on a pathway that you have determined that you were the material. Okay, so they have to get to a certain point before the next thing opens. And then they have to get to a certain point before the next thing opens. And you can do this where they get a, a you know, like a certain score on a quiz or an exercise, or they just even just watch a video, um, you know, before they do this exercise or something like that. So you can set all kinds of stuff for that. Um, let me show you kind of what this looks like. Um, here's an example of a banner image that's too big. <laughs> <laughs> I made this image and it's and it doesn't quite fit on on the screen. This is why you you want to make it fairly horizontal and not too big or it's going to cut off for you. So um, this is one where we have divided it into units um, and so they move through it. Well each unit has you know some reading materials, some videos, some study cards and exercises. Okay and they have to get a 50% on an exercise before they move to the next exercise, and they have to get a 50% on this exercise before they get to the quiz, okay? And then they have to get 100% on the quiz before they get to move to the next unit. So it's basically making sure they don't just, you know, click a bunch of buttons and move through it. They have to actually, like, pay attention and, and score well on this. You have to make sure, if you set it this way, that they get multiple attempts on an assignment or a quiz or an exercise uh, because then they're just stuck if if they you know if, if you say well you have to get 75 percent on this to move on and and you don't give them multiple tries to do it then they're stuck and and it goes nowhere so um, you have to set it so multiple attempts is on and you have to allow unlimited attempts um, so just to sort of show you that um, so what does this mean it's here okay so i've got this exercise here and this is exercise one number two and I've got, you turn adaptive release on here, you, you click the arrow and you go to this pop-up menu and you go to adaptive release. Um, sometimes maybe you just wanna set a date, that's all. Um, you don't actually have to go into adaptive release to set the date for this. You can set that on a regular, any kind of regular item. Um, maybe you only want um, specific, a certain lab section into it, you can do it that way. Um, but for this one I have, okay, they have to, Here's the grade center column on exercise one, one, before they get to one, two, they have to score at least 50% or greater on this one. Okay. So maybe you only want them to just try it. Maybe it's a homework assignment that they just have to turn in. Then you click this one. User has at least one attempt for this item. So if they like do a homework assignment that is not auto graded and you just want them to turn it in, click this one. So they turn in their homework and boom, the next thing opens and they can move on to that. Um, or review status. Maybe I want to, um, let's see, I can, ooh, maybe I want them to, uh, you know, do the unit one videos. Okay. All right. Here's the unit one videos. Maybe I just want them to review this. If I do this, it will put a little button by the unit one videos 
that makes them click it to say they reviewed it. Okay, now that do they actually have to watch them all? They do not. But they have to think about it and click the button that says they've watched them all um, for the next thing to open. So if you have something like a reading or a video that you want them to read or watch before they do an exercise, this is this is the way that you can add that. Um, like I said, it may not they may not actually read the whole thing or do the whole thing, but it at least makes them think about yes, I actually do need to do this. Um, so yeah, this one an auto graded thing they have to score this much and then they can go on but you can do it for lots of other things and it basically just helps you keep them on a path that you want them on you know so that they're doing things in an order um that you that is the way that you want them to do this is also really good for okay i need to understand a and b before i get to c so don't jump ahead to c until you've done a and b um it it lets them lets them do it that way Excellent. Thank you so much, Lisa. So I'm going to do both questions for you first, and then we'll get um, questions to Peter. So first question for you, how do you do categories in the grade book? Would you be able to quickly show oh. that where that's located? Yes, I will certainly show you where that is located. That I'm sorry, I did not realize that, that, um, that people did that. Okay. Um, well, I'll just go to this grade book here. Um, I've got a full grade center. Um, you can do it a couple of different ways. Like here's the exercise and you go to edit column information. Um, and here's the category assignment. So you can change that to attendance, essay, exam, survey, test, discussion, blog, whatever. You can create your own categories too. Um, it will let you do that. Um, you can change it in Grade Center if you've already set something up and you don't want to like recreate it. Or um, if you, let's just say, oh, I'm going to create an assignment here. I'm not really going to do it, but blah, blah, blah. You know, so I'm going to do that, fill that in. I'm going to give you a due date. I'm going to give you points possible. Oh, that isn't going to work. There are some times that they let you actually categorize it. Usually, if it's an assignment, it'll automatically categorize as assignment. If it's a test, it'll automatically categorize as test and then you have to manually change it to quiz. So most of the stuff you have to manually change if it isn't a sort of designated category in black test or a survey will automatically go as that. If you have journals, it'll automatically go as journal. So if you wanna count your journals all as you know, a certain percentage, you can do that. Um, but yes, it's back, it's in the grade center, um, each column you're just editing column information and then you're going to category. And you can change the display on there too. If you want to give them the score and the percentage, you can do that. If you want to give them the, you know, percentage and the score, you can do that. You can, you can change lots of stuff there. So I usually do the score, oops, yeah, and the percentage. So they know how many points they got and then what percentage it is, did they pass, can they move on? That sort of thing. Um, score attempts using highest grade. This is when if you have multiple attempts on something um, and you need to get to a certain level to move on to the next level, the, keep the highest one. Um, that's how you can do that. So there's lots of things that you can um, add on there. You can put a due date in there if you want to. Include it in the Grade Center calculations. Show it to students. You can do that too. Um, you know, but this is, this is where you're going to change, change the category there. Okay, next question. Um, I'm going to read this one directly, and if there's cl clarification, hopefully the, the writer will come in with that. Um, when you're adding new content, the new material appears at the bottom of all previously posted materials. Is there a shortcut to moving the new material to the top? Um, if anybody knows, I would love to hear it, because I don't know. I don't think so. I'm always manually moving stuff. I hate that. Okay. There's a little button at the top that um, lets you, it, it will give you a pull down menu that'll show everything in there. And you just click on the one you want to move up and you just push the up arrows until it's where, where it's supposed to be. Okay. Hopefully that answered. Um, Lisa, another question for you. When I'm creating banners, um, does the banner... I'm sorry, you cut out there. I missed the middle. Okay. When you are creating banners, does the banner move to the entry point that Peter showed us? It, it's on whatever page you designate as your entry point. Okay. 
So um, like Peter changes his entry point every week, the banner should just stay with whatever is the current entry point. Um, my entry point is static. I usually have them land on the announcement so that if, if I have put something there, they see it. <laughs> um, because I know they email the announcements too, but they, they don't always read that. So um, it's right there. Yeah, it, it's gonna, the banner will be present on whatever page you have designated as your course's entry point. Okay. Um, Peter, there's been a question about how do we make sure that students are seeing feedback? Um, we had someone who said that students have said they don't always see feedback on the rubric. How do you make sure students can see that? Um, I don't put feedback in the rubric. I know that some folks do and I, and the video mentioned that I put my feedback in the, um, in the assignment score window. Um, and I, I haven't had students, um, mention that they don't see that. So I don't, if, if somebody else has dealt with this, they probably have a better answer than me. There is the default with rubrics is not to show it. Um, so there's a box on the rubric. If you're using a rubric, oh. you have to check the box that says show rubric or show feedback. And if you don't check it, the students will not see it. Right. So um, you have to, let me see if I can find an assignment that I had that has a rubric on it. Um, oh, here, let me see. Um, Cause it is kind of, it's sort of hidden there. I mean, there's things that, oh, here's one, okay. Um, Um, okay, um, this one isn't even graded yet. So um, let me show you just real quick here. Um, okay, so if you are grading here, um, you've got your story editing rubric used for grading. Okay, so I've set mine up a little bit different than Peter did. Um, you know, it's a, it's a little simpler. Um, also, one of the really nice things is a, on the rubric is, you know, I can go do, 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 I'm just doing, I'm not really going to keep this. Um, okay, so I've got 40 and I'm like, well, this is actually a little bit better. You know, maybe I would have given that one like an 8.5 or an 8.5. I can like fudge that a little. And if I want to give them a 42, I can. Um, and then you can put feedback here, but here is where you have to look. Show descriptions and show feedback. And if you don't check those things, they will not see the rubric. So if you just want to use a rubric for yourself, don't show this. If you want to put your feedback just back here in the regular um, grading box, like, okay, um, I'm gonna cancel this. Okay, so just in the regular feedback to learner box here, where there's probably a better chance that they will actually see it, um, you can do it that way. But yes, when you pop out the rubric, if you don't check show descriptions and you don't check show feedback, they will not see it. And Blackboard automatically leaves those unchecked. So you have to actually check them so that they will see it. There's also, when you're setting up the assignment and associating the rubric, there are three options um, in the assignment set. Uh, and I think one of them is about showing feedback. Okay. Um, in, I'm gonna do one more question, then move on, because I'm trying to keep an eye on time here for us. Um, when a professor adds a comment to a discussion board or gives a grade, do students get an email or any other kind of notification that alerts them that they need to go look at it in Blackboard? That is a great question. I wish we had a student here because I honestly don't know what the student interface is like, what they see and what they can choose to see. And I think there are alerts that they can set, but I honestly don't know. Okay. Okay. Um, and I'm going to have our presenters just pop their email links. Um, actually, I'll pop them into the chat because I'm in charge of the chat here. And if you have, I know there's additional questions I didn't get to. Um, and so you can email those to them. So we're going to go ahead and go to our next presenter, which is Doug Ward. Yeah, let me make sure that I'm back here in, in action. Yeah. I, um, there we go. Let's see if I can get this thing started. Surely it will start. 
I've got a lot of images in there. Um, I'm going to keep it fairly short, and I'm just going to talk about connecting with students in online classes. That's what Heather wanted me to talk about, and I, I think this is a really thing, and I'll, I'll talk a little bit more about that, but there's really, after the spring especially, and that really wasn't true online teaching, it was more throw it together and put it out there for students uh, in the spring. But there was a lot of comments and a lot of, of, of complaints from students about, well, this is, I want my money back. This wasn't good. This was really this was really crummy. I didn't, I didn't want an online class, but I, I think the, the thing that is frustrating to me is when students say, well, I didn't sign up for an online class. It's not worth as much. And that's just not true. I mean, if you, if you're doing it well, an online class actually can be just as effective. And I'll, I'll, I'll just, this is just a student that I had last fall. And I, I hear this a lot from my students and I work at it. I mean, this is not something that just happens where you're making these kinds of connections and creating community. But what I really focus on in online teaching is creating community so that the students do feel like they are part of something substantial, something bigger. It's not just me out there working on my own. And it's pedagogy. I mean, there's technology involved in it, but it is pedagogy. I mean, at the at the base, it's good pedagogy. It's it's working with students in a lot of different ways, and I'll I'll show you that. And I, this is something that I, this illustration is something. One time I I use uh, bots in my online classes sometimes, and this is one where the students were, and the bots just go out and collect information and bring it back from the students. And one time the, the students were joking and saying, well, how do we know that, that Doug Ward is real and that he's not a bot? So I, I created that for them. And I think that's just to just look for those kinds of things that you can do to reach out to students and just have some fun with the class because I think that's one of the things that that students miss about that in person teaching is just that spontaneity some some of the things that come up the conversations like that that they're not used to, to having and when you're working online too, make sure that you are thinking in terms of what you can do with the medium, that there are lots of things that you can do online that you can't do in person. A lot of times online teaching becomes more of an exercise in, oh my gosh, I have this class that I've done in person. What can I do to put it online? And I have to mimic everything that I do in person online and that just doesn't happen. It's just not going to work that way. There are th some things that you can start with that you can, you can sort of mimic, but every kind of technology is like that, that we take up the language of the old and try to put it into the new. And yet what we need to do is to start fresh and to start thinking about what can you do with that technology. And I've got something from Robin DeRosa from Plymouth State University here who's, who talks about that. And that's, you know, you, you have a lot of options online. You have a lot of ways that you can experiment, a lot of things that you can try. So, you know, kind of model for students. What are the kinds of things that you want to see from them and how can you model that for them? And then use your class really as a way of connecting. To me, online learning is not just about pushing information out. How can I help my students connect to me, to each other, to the world? How can they help? How can I help them better understand the world they're living in and actually help them learn about learning on their own because that's what's going to serve them in the long run. It's not anything particular that they'll take away from my class. It's really about how can they learn how to learn and keep learning because if they don't, they're, they're not going to go very far because things are changing far too fast for, uh, for anything to uh, not keep up. 
So I'll just, uh, I mean, here, it, 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 keeping up, this is something, this was from about 1910. It's from uh, a French artist who was asked to envision the future of 2000. And uh, this is often, I like this because, I mean, it's funny, but it's also just, it's almost how we think of teaching sometimes. It's that let's push out information to students, we'll just fill their brains. Uh, rather than how can we engage them? How can we create courses that take advantage of the medium, that are interactive, that help us work with students and really invest in them as partners? Not necessarily telling them what to do, but helping them take risks, helping them explore, helping them find the kinds of things that are meaningful to them, while also achieving the kinds of course goals that, that we need to reach. And I do this in several ways, and I'll show you, I'll give you what that means to me. Uh, Peter and, and uh, Lisa talked about the, the organization, and I think there's a lot to learn from good design in terms of organization in Blackboard and wherever else, it's, it's clear students know where to go. I mean, that's really the, the beginning. And when they're online, you're not there in a classroom to tell them, here's what we're going to do, here's what we're going to do. You really have to be able to spell that out. And that's what's so important in an online class. You really have to be able to to lead students through the material, to explain to them, well, not only the what, but why. Why are we doing this? Why is this important? And when you can do that, they start to buy into things. And that's when they really get excited, and then you can really help them learn. Media technology. Now, I do use media, I use technology, but I think technology has to be the, is a tool that is there to serve a need, to help me meet a goal. It's not something that I like to dump a lot of technology on students just because. And I talk with students about why I'm using anything to, to help them understand that this is not just something that I'm, I'm pushing out to them just because. Um, I try to make things visual as well whenever possible because the students themselves are, you know, they're living in a visual world. And that's one of the downsides of Blackboard. And I, I like what Lisa was showing there with the banners. I think anything you can do to make Blackboard more visual, just adding some elements like the banner, some, some uh, images within, the, within each module or within each element, anything like that really does help, uh, makes it more, makes it feel, more personal, makes it feel more comfortable. And one of the things that I get a lot from, from faculty when I'm working with is my students are in a media rich world and work in highly produced or are used to seeing highly produced web content. And then they come to my class in Blackboard and it doesn't measure up. How can I how can I do that? How can I make it more visual? How can I make it more, uh, more enthralling to them? And Blackboard has a lot of limits and there's only so much you can do and you're not going to do, you're not going to produce the same kind of content that you would in, in a movie, in a, in a website where they have a large staff that's doing nothing but producing that kind of material. But there are some small things that you can do. And I won't, you know, I won't go into a lot of that. I think that, that again, Lisa talked about the, the banners, but just some images, just some ways to find ways of, or just some ways to make it more, a bit more personal. When I'm teaching online, one of the things that I do is that at the beginning, the students create profiles of themselves and that they share uh, with classmates. And these are, I, I model it. I mean, I often try to bring in some personal details and students are going to be really very varied about what kinds of things they want to share and I don't try to push them to share anything that they don't want others to know but I think that helping 
students get to know each other and to have those sh those small profiles that are there all semester and I really rely on those from the students to help me kind of tailor the content to tailor my comments to what they're interested in and I go back to those profiles a lot during the semester. I use discussion boards, I do podcasts, video, instant messaging, I, just a lot of different things. And I've got over on the left, I do, I use Blackboard and I think it's important to use Blackboard to maintain the consistency for students. But I've also found that if you really want students to engage, you, you have to move outside Blackboard. And I've used Slack for quite a few years and I've recently moved to Microsoft Teams. Uh, last year I moved to Teams because that's the tool that the university supports. And I think that more and more students will become comfortable with it. And it has the, the capabilities, just about everything that Slack does. It, it's, a, it's a way of doing instant messaging. It's a way of, I put my discussion boards on there. I can share material with students. I, that's where I do peer feedback. I can put up a, a Q&A area on there and often the students will go in and answer each other's questions before I even have a chance to get to it. Those are, I, I think that kind of place or some way of communicating with students like that and giving them an opportunity to communicate is really important. And I found that if, if you're not creating that space for them, they will do it for themselves and shut you out. So I mean, that's where I use something, something that something Slack uh, Teams uh, that I have found works very well in engaging students in that sort of interaction that I think is really important for an online class. It's really important to structure the class and that organization is, is important that I talked about in Blackboard. I send out every week an, um, an email message to my students and say, here's what's happening this week. I just remind them of things that's due, of things that are coming due. And I also use that as a way to share some just off the cuff kinds of things that I find that, I, that, that are interesting that I might have come across in email or I might have come across on lists, I might have come across on video, that I might have come across that are links, uh, that are in the news, just some things that help pique curiosity that I find very interesting that are that may be tied to the class, may not be tied to the class, but that help bring them in and make them want to read what I have to say. And I found that that can be a really good way to get students up to date on, well, not only what they have to do, but also on just making sure they're, they're moving into the material that I want them to move into, because there's always something else in there that they don't know what they're going to find. So there, that's where back kind of back to that surprise. I mean, what kinds of things are they going to find in there that are, that are meaningful, that are fun, that are interesting, uh, not just, oh, I have to go in here and I have to learn something, that I have to do something because somebody told me I have to do it. I try to meet with my students individually. Often it's just by phone. I mean, it really varies depending on what students, how students want to meet. Often it's phone conversations. It can be over Skype. It can be over Teams. There's just lots of ways to do that. But don't, you know, don't overlook some simple things like phone conversations because that can be a very meaningful way to interact with students and in a meaningful way. I also do a lot of audio feedback, sometimes video feedback, but the audio feedback I found is really helpful to me in making connections with students in that when they turn in, I will often go back to them, not only with some written comments, but then I will create audio for them and lead them through my, uh, my suggestions for them and my comments on them. And, what I find with that is that students will sometimes play that back over and over and over and take notes from it. And I get messages back saying, oh my gosh, you took the time to talk with me about my assignment. Oh my gosh, this was wonderful. And 
it's I, I so I find the tone of voice as much as anything is very helpful because if I have something that's critical that I want students that you know maybe they haven't done something very well and I want to make sure that they're focusing on that I can also say you know I really like what you're doing in in this section but let's work on this and here's how you can do it and just that kind of tone that that I can't do necessarily in in text makes a big difference for students and finally I'll just talk about authentic assignments choices for students and authentic assignments, I like to give them choices and, and some things that they have an opportunity to move into areas that they're interested in. And journalism is mostly about this. But if you're thinking about, I want students, if I tell you to do something, I want you to go and I want you to write a paper about the French Revolution, you're going to roll your eyes and say, well, I don't want to write about the French Revolution. But if I say, I want you to choose an area uh, that you're interested in, and then I want you to follow these kind of guidelines and to do the research, write something for me. Now you kind of get their attention. If once you have to do some, uh, some guidance for them, some leading where that might go. But if you can seed some of that control to the students, they're much more likely to buy in uh, to what they're, to the kinds of things that you want them to do. And I'll stop there. I just, uh, I, I wanted to run through some things. I think I, I put a lot of material on the Flex teaching site. This is something that my, my colleague, Andrea Greenhoot and I have created through CTE. And we have a lot of material up there about online, about hybrid and tools and things like that. So uh, I would encourage you to take a look at that site if you haven't. And Heather, I'll stop there. I'm, I would, um, I think I'll just take questions. Okay, so um, we had several questions about the audio feedback. What tool are you using for the audio feedback? Where do you load that feedback? Do you provide it within Blackboard, within Teams? Where does that come back to students? You can do it a lot of ways. And I, Blackboard has a tool, has an audio and video feedback tool. And I don't think a lot of people know about it. It's if you, you, if you create an assignment and then when you're, giving, when you're giving feedback in the assignment, it has an option there that you can record video or you can record audio and talk to the students that way with the feedback if you would like to do that. I do it usually with a, with a small recorder. I have a recorder and I will be reading the paper and I'll, then I'll start talking and I'll do the I'll record audio. Uh, and then I'll drop it into Teams along with a copy of the paper. I also have, uh, I, I use an iPad and there's an app called iAnnotate that I like a lot. It, you work with a PDF and then it allows you to write document, but then I can create as many one minute audio comments on there as I want. It's like a $10, something like a $10 app. So, I mean, those are some of the ways that I've done it. There are a lot of other ways that you can, that you can give that kind of feedback, but it's available in Blackboard. Okay. Um, so we had a couple comments about, they really liked you when you said you wanted to create a surprise for students. What right. examples do you, could you give us a couple of examples of what you mean by surprising them? Well, surprising them is just like, um, well, if you look at that second slide that I had, I mean, that's an example. I mean, if you're looking for something there, the slide changed as you looked at it. And just some things where you've got to be watching. It's like, wait, wait a minute, what was I seeing? What happened there? Sometimes it's just, um, I, I will, oh, in the spring, one of the things that I shared with my students is something that I found on TikTok that I shared with them and saying, okay, well, well you're stuck inside. Uh, I, I, and I'm not making this up. Uh, people are having competitions to see uh, how many rolls of toilet paper their cats and dogs can jump over, right? I mean, it, just some of those wild things like that, that, that I find that are, that are fun to share. Um, often I try to tie things to the, to the content of the class. Um, 
Let me if know if I, that screws you up. Chuck, you're on, you, you need to mute. Um, and it's, uh, uh, if I have like in the fall, I had a data class, I'll find some interesting things about data where I found some interesting visualizations or found some interesting ways that people have used data. And then I'll tie that back in. I have a, and this I got started with Slack because Slack, when you set it up, has a random channel in it. And I really like that. So I always use the random channel and I get, uh, I, I, when I find interesting links, I throw them in there, uh, things that I find. And then I find students start sharing things. And then it just, once you get them going, it can kind of snowball. Uh, I know that others have done that on Facebook, have created a, a private Facebook group. I mean, there are just, there are lots of ways to do that, but it's just finding some of those things that connect with students and that are, that they might not have seen or might have seen and that you can offer some, some insight into. Uh, I've done that with just with music videos and just talked with them about, okay, here's, um, we've talked about drones and here's something you can see that this was shot with a drone and here's how you can, here's how you know that. So again, I'm looking for ways to, to tie it to class material, but not always. Okay. Um, you've mentioned podcasts. Are these podcasts that you created that the students created or outside podcasts? I've created podcasts. I have a channel there. I have a SoundCloud channel and I, I create podcasts and the podcasts that I found that work the best are conversations with someone else. And I, tr I really try to do that as much as I can to have someone else within a conversation with me about a topic for the week. I find that just having a monologue is not always, is not the best way to, to share audio. But sometimes I do that if I don't have something else that I need to do. But yeah, either ones that I create and then they're, I mean, they're very easy to do. And then I load them up and then students can, uh, can listen to them on, um, on their phones if they want to. They don't have to be tied to Blackboard uh, to listen to that. They can if they want to. I make them available on Blackboard. They're also available on SoundCloud, so they can download them if they want and listen to them wherever they are. And I think that that's one of the things with an online class that, that I like to be able to do something like that is that they don't have to be tied to their computer all the time. And they can still be working through material in a class and thinking about some things in the class. Okay, final question we have, how many students do you have in your course? And then kind of connected to that, um, how do you get students to create their profiles and share with the class? Like what medium and how I usually have, yeah, I usually have 30 to 35 students. It depends, 25 to 35. I mean, sometimes 20 to 35. It really, it's, it's usually within that range depending on the class. Um, I have them work in teams. I'll have them create a profile in teams or before that Slack. Sometimes I've used OneNote for it, but I, I, right now it would be in teams and I'll create a separate channel in teams so that they can create it in there and can add images. Often they'll share images of their pets or, you know, vacation or things like that, something meaningful to them. And I get it going just by, by modeling and I'll create my own and put it in there. And then often the students will say, oh, that's the kind of thing that you want. And they'll, they'll kind of follow suit with that. Okay, excellent. Well, thank you so much for your time today. We appreciate it. And we will have a time for more questions at the end. So if anything else comes to mind, um, please stay tuned for that. Um, so we will now go to Dr. Amy Lyersoff, and she is going to talk to us about working with your students in a variety of online topics here, Amy. All right. Thank you. 
So um, kind of extending on um, Doug's comments here previously, I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking with you about engaging students in online courses and specifically kind of in three areas. Um, one is going a little deeper into the idea of building community. Then I want to talk a little bit about instructor presence as well as um, how you integrate Zoom with Blackboard for folks who are doing synchronous learning. So one of the benefits of our quick transition online in the spring was that we'd really already had some community built um, and sort of fostered in our courses. Um, and since that already existed, that gave us a little bit of a foundation to work on. This fall, we won't have that, that same um, opportunity. So um, we might need to think a little bit about how we would replicate that um, in-class or face-to-face -face experience in the online environment. Um, and there's several different ways that you can do this, but it's important not only um, just sort of because students like it, but also um, we know that that sort of faceless online environment can really dehumanize participants and it can really lead us to engage in some behaviors that um, we certainly would not engage in um, were we having these interactions uh, face to face. So some things that you can do um, to rehumanize your course um, is, as Doug said earlier, you know, get your students thinking about each other. Um, low stakes voice thread introductions, again, piggybacking off of what he had said, creating that kind of chat room environment with a discussion board is always helpful. Working in those real life examples from your students' experiences um, into your assignments, into your comments, you can let them know um, that you are actually paying attention to those things that they are posting as well. Um, another couple areas that I think um, are important that have worked well for us in leadership studies um, is getting the students to rely on each other. Um, that level of accountability can be really important. So one thing that you can do is deputize students and um, make them content experts. And you can do this by, you know, creating a group and then have them maybe put out some explainers or examples, of course, concepts that relate back to the lectures. Those are things they could pop into discussion boards. Um, you could have them propose some exam questions or create some study guides for upcoming exams or assignments. You could have those expert teams help you facilitate an exam review. Um, and then also, again, kind of piggybacking off of what Doug said, the students can contribute to those Q&A discussion threads that you have started. Sometimes, again, they can get the questions from their peers answered um, more quickly than, than what you can get on and respond. The other thing that we're doing um, in leadership studies is creating support teams among students. Um, I think this is going to be particularly important this semester, given the challenges that we face um, with, you know, access to classroom and student health and the health of other folks within the students uh, environment. But it's very possible that we're going to have students miss class a little bit more than usual. Um, and creating a support team among students is going to be helpful for you to not always be the first stop for everybody to debrief on a missed class. So they can get notes from their team members, they can review from a missed class, they can become an exam study group. And another thing that we've found um, helpful is they can peer edit each other's assignments, um, which can really reduce the amount of time that you need to go back through with constructive criticism um, as you are um, evaluating the work that they've done. Now the second area um, is instructor presence. And for those of us who um, are familiar with the scholarship of teaching and learning um, or from your early pedagogy classes, instructor immediacy in the classroom, research shows us is a, a statistically significant uh, predictor of student learning and student motivation. 
in the online environment, um, instructor presence equates to classroom immediacy. And it also shows that same statistical significance um, for outcomes. So what are some things that you can do um, to sort of um, create that online presence for your students? Again, um, Doug covered this a little bit earlier, demonstrating care beyond content, learning those things about your students and using them. Um, you know, dropping in, hey, I found this great article that relates to this thing you're interested in, or, um, you know, in the comments to assignments also, hey, I saw this, or this is really something um, that you've done a lot of work on. Uh, one thing that some of my colleagues did last semester that I'm going to adopt moving forward is offering a pre-course access and concern survey. Um, we just created something quickly in Qualtrics. It's anonymous, um, but it asks students about their access to technology, um, especially after our November transition back to online only. Things like, will you have access to a computer? Will you have access to internet? Um, are there other things that you need me to know that are concerning you about your ability to be um, successful in the course or to access the online learning in this course? And then at the bottom also, um, there's a little reminder that this is um, an anonymous survey, but if they want to speak with you more about their situation, um, that you would be happy to do that. And then you can take the results of those surveys, even though they are anonymous, and figure out some different things maybe um, related to your course that could ease the burden on students. So one thing that we're doing is um, opening the last three modules of the class at the same time and early. So for students who may have transition issues, if they want to complete the class ahead of time, they're absolutely able to do that. Um, we also, you know, maybe put some things um, in document form that you would normally have um, in an audio or visual format so that students who may have reduced bandwidth um, could download something or read something in, on a mobile platform um, and not use as much bandwidth as they would for more mediated information. Um, also, uh, the online presence allows us to leverage visuals in a way that, that we may not be able to otherwise. So creating a warm and personal instructor introduction, again, using VoiceThread or something like that, and posting that um, as part of your Blackboard site. Um, in addition to um, providing feedback uh, using audio or visual methods, um, consider explaining the syllabus and the schedule or explaining assignments um, with little video clips, the same way that you might do that talking with them in front of a class. And then also, again, back to Doug's idea of using um, verbal feedback. And again, voice thread is just something that I'm comfortable with. Another option is to hold some live virtual events. Um, whether that's office hours, question and answers, exam reviews. Um, I've dropped a link in here. Um, there's a great free Jeopardy uh, template out there that you can use for an exam review that students can click through. Something different and kind of fun for them. Um, and then also just joining the discussion. Drop into that discussion board, interact with them. Um, if you're finding that the instruct at the uh, discussion board is maybe not um, picking up speed, um, consider incentivizing students' visits there with things like little extra credit um, opportunities or some hints for the upcoming exam or upcoming assignments. One thing that um, I did last fall that has reflected positively on my um, evaluations also. Um, was really uh, checking in with students frequently about um, their well being. And, you know, sometimes doing this not so subtly, um, just like a quick um, around the class, real quick before we got started. What are you doing to take care of yourself? Also, providing them with a fair amount of self care resources, both the ones that KU offers through CAPS. Um, and just, you know, things that I found online 
at UCLA's um, Mindful Awareness Resource Center has some great um, like three minute and five minute um, guided meditations. And so just doing some of that kind of stuff to say, you know, hey, Dr. L does care about you just beyond your ability to, to pass her class at the moment. And then finally, I want to talk a little bit about integrating Zoom with Blackboard for the folks who are doing um, synchronous as well as asynchronous online courses. Um, last year, we in the Institute had um, a CTE supported uh, course transformation mini grant and our instructional design just got completely blown up uh, with COVID and our retreat online. But um, one of the biggest takeaways that we did have from the work that we were able to do was the idea that we cannot assume that our students' sort of digital nativity um, is going to transfer over to instructional technology. And so if you're going to do synchronous or even asynchronous um, online, for that matter, plan some time in uh, deliberately to teach the technology to the students. We do this in a number of different ways. We use that pre-course survey. Um, we deploy more than one pre-course communication that they will need to do technology-wise in order to get up to speed um, to join into class on the first day. Um, so a lot of that is around here's where you need to go to get your Zoom set up, and here's the instructions for setting up your Zoom, and here are the people who can help you if your Zoom isn't working right, and here's the technology that you need to participate the best on Zoom. Um, also, we allow extra time on that first day of class to do some troubleshooting and just talking through questions with students. And then the last thing that we found was really important um, was covering netiquette. Um, You'll see in a minute here what we've done. Excuse me. Don't know where that came from. Um, we've done a, a very detailed Nenekit sheet. It is included in that Flex Teaching um, site that Doug referenced earlier. Um, but students are used to a social media environment, and that doesn't translate well into class. Um, so yes, we have had to tell students things like you need to be dressed in class. Um, you should not be attending your online class um, while you are driving or while you are working out um, or while you are cooking dinner or taking care of your children. Um, but that this is time that you need to set aside for class or if that's not possible, we need to communicate and set up some expectations for how you can continue to participate. It's also important to go ahead and make access to Zoom seamless, and I'll show you here in a minute um, how we've done that with my Blackboard site. But we've created a web link on the navigation bar um, and included the password there. So all that students need to do to get connected to our Zoom classroom is to click on that that particular link. Um, that also is really helpful if you're doing breakout groups and some other things in Zoom, because if a student has to access the Zoom link through Blackboard, um, then you know that they are already logged on to Blackboard with their KU credentials as opposed to joining on the phone, which can sometimes get clicky if you're using um, breakout rooms. We also have that using Zoom content area. It has setup instructions has IT support information so that you're not becoming a mini IT department for your course, the netiquette guidelines, and then also some information for students about alternate internet access points if they don't have reliable uh, internet access at home. Third thing to think about if you're teach, especially if you're teaching um, synchronously, is um, what sort of standards is your uh, class community going to uphold? So are you going to ask students to have their camera on? Are you going to ask them to um, you know, mute or unmute their microphone? Um, how are you going to handle things like questions or um, feedback during the time that you are together? 
Um, and there's a really great blog out there, uh, Rebecca Barrett Fox, who is um, a multi-degree KU alum um, and KU instructor, is now on staff at the University of Arkansas. Um, and she's written a blog, uh, sort of from a social justice perspective, about um, thinking a little bit more deeply about um, synchronous learning, and especially about um, what we're really asking when we ask students to invite us into their homes and into their personal lives via Zoom um, and on-camera learning. So I would encourage you to look at that. I'm actually going to use this as sort of a, a discussion starter um, in both my upper level undergraduate course and my graduate course in this fall. And then finally, um, one of the other findings from our um, grant work last year was that really um, synchronous learning online flattens that hierarchy that we see in the classroom. So no longer are you um, sort of the sage on the stage, but you're just another face tile on the screen. Um, I found that my students um, began interacting more with each other in this format rather than constantly looking to me um, for validation or for feedback. Um, but really that's something again that you can encourage and really get students interacting with each other rather than you sort of mediating the discussion. And then finally here as promised, I just thought I'd show you how we had the Zoom links integrated. This is for my um, upper level communication and leadership class that I'll be teaching in the fall. And over here on um, the navigation pane, you see um, a web link to the pre-course survey. They can just click and complete that. Um, the content area for using Zoom. Um, and again, that contains all of the directions, uh, the netiquette information, IT information. Um, the link to our virtual classroom, including the password and the links as well to my virtual office hours for the semester. And um, by way of personalization up there at the top, um, a little bit more information about me and the new puppy, Roosevelt. So I will go ahead and stop share here and Heather can pepper me with questions. Excellent. Well, first for everyone, um, the slides that she is showing are in our Google Drive folder that I shared with you. So all of those links, everyone was very worried. How do I get those links? So those are in there. Also, um, generously put in that pre-course survey. So that is also in that folder. It's named LDST 431 Access for Synchronous Learning. Um, so if you're interested in that survey, duplicating that kind of pre-course survey, all of that is in there, um, as are the videos that Peter showed. So pretty much everything our people have shared today is in that folder. Um, one question we had for you beyond where's all the stuff and how do I get it? Um, I will say real quickly, um, in addition to the textual version of that survey, if you have a Qualtrics account through KU, I can also copy that survey to you. So shoot me an email if you'd like to do that and we can, we can connect that via Qualtrics. Okay, I'll pop in um, your email after uh, I kind of ask this question or while you're answering it. Um, so there's a question about how do I minimize the risk of students misusing their support teams during online exams? Um, a few different thoughts there. Um, one, our, um, I don't use exams in my upper level courses just because it, it doesn't really fit the learning outcomes. Um, but for our, um, for our entry level um, introduction to leadership cor courses, we do use um, two objective exams throughout the semester. And early on, we just accepted the fact that students um, would not be taking Exams sort of in the same way that they would be taking one in a classroom with, you know, everybody eyes on the desk, materials away, that sort of thing. And so rather than um, trying to build things in to ensure that students aren't um, working together, um, 
we created an exam that would make that difficult to do. So we created a question pool with far more questions than what we were asking. Um, we had them randomized, so each student will get a different set of questions. Um, we have the exam timed um, so that they take um, between 40 and 50 questions. And again, these are multiple choice. 40 and 50 in about an hour's time period. So they're not going to have a lot of time to collaborate back and forth. They really just kind of need to get in there and get the exam done. Um, and then also really we've weighted the exam such that there are other measures of student performance. Um, so that, you know, it's not just like two exams and that's the entire grade for the semester. So if students have figured out how to collaborate, um, even though we do say that this is, you know, open book, open note, but not open friend, um, it, it really, it's, there are going to be other ways that we will know um, how the students are meeting learning objectives. Okay. Um, a comment, respond us which I'm not familiar with. Respondus is an option for testing integrity from one of our attendees. And then someone else says, removing them from teams during exam time could uh, keep them from that type of chit chat. So a couple of ideas for everyone there. Yep. Um, thank we you. We have found that they tend to use group me anyway. Right, <laughs> they're chatting behind your back no matter yeah, what. Yeah, they are. <laughs> okay, thank you so much. That was, a, an, I, I just wanna highlight Something mentioned because a couple of you guys were chatting at me about this. Um, just the importance of showing students how to access material within Blackboard, within all of your systems. Um, a couple of you mentioned that earlier when we were talking about gradebook. Anytime you can assume that they don't know and give them a lesson is a wise one. So I'm so glad you mentioned that. So thank you so much. We will now transition to Jerry Berenson and Jerry B, as we call her over in the J School, is going to talk to you about online tools to engage learners. Um, and so I will let her take it away. You can see my screen now, Heather? I can Cause... see you, I can see the screen. We are good to go. Okay. Um... So really what I'm going to talk about is just different ways of presenting information to students and some, just some things to think about. I'm not really going to show you how to use any of these, but there is a much longer and more involved uh, copy of this presentation in Heather's Blackboard folder, and it has links to various things. So just remember, this is just to get some ideas. You don't have to do these but it's an idea to present information in different ways. And why is that? Well, it's because everybody learns differently. And I, I really started thinking about this after um, the spring classes, when I knew I was going to be teaching all online in summer, because I had a lot of students from my classes tell me things like, well, I got tired of watching videos you know, or, or things like that. So the idea here is that you can present information in different ways and that way you may not be um, satisfying every learner every time, but you're gonna throughout the course of your semester hit everybody with something that works best for them. Um, and I used my class this summer as a guinea pig. I had them do a, um, Anonymous survey, um, I got 26 of my 29 students to do it and tell me what they liked best. Um, they did both just a poll, a vote, but then they gave me comments and they were very helpful. It's, it's not scientific, but it helps. So this is, you know, if you're gonna do the easiest thing you can possibly do in Blackboard, you're going to just present text-only information, right? And what is it? It's boring. This is the only big text only thing I presented this summer. And I, I did it basically because of what the content was. I couldn't really figure out for this particular um, 
thing how to present in a really visual way. But this is about three times as long as what you see here. And students, both students uh, across the board rated text only as the worst way to get information. They didn't like reading the book either, but they had to because they had to take quizzes. So why, if you're having them read a book already, why give them a lot of text only? So the next thing most people go to is just the plain video. And I do a lot of that. I, I do it easy. I use QuickTime to record of narrating a slideshow. Um, I don't worry about the, the gaffes unless it's a stupid big gaff because you make gaffes when you're teaching in your classroom too, right? Um, students really like videos. Videos rated number one. But there was a distinct group of, of students who thought videos were the worst thing they did. But they told me generally after 20 minutes I'd lost them. And I tended to do my videos were 20 to 25 minutes, 19 to 25 minutes, something like that. So just don't make them that long because if you were teaching in a class and you had an hour and 15 minute class, you're not gonna spend every bit of that time looking at a video. Um, so let's go beyond that. What's some other things you could do? Well, they like the videos and one thing you can do are what are called whiteboard videos. There are numerous um, programs that allow you to do whiteboard videos, and they're great for explainers. Um, you know, if you think of them as short tutorials, taking you through something step by step, they're very visual. And what students told me they liked about them is that it broke up the information into small pieces for them, and those small pieces were easy to watch again. I use a program called Doodly, which right now is about $240. I, I kind of techie, so I bought it when it was in uh, beta for $69. But there are free whiteboard video programs out there, both that are free to everybody and some that are free if you're an educator. So that just don't go, don't do a 10 minute whiteboard, it's too much of a good thing. So what I started doing this summer is something I called a mixed graphic presentation. And I was doing it with Adobe Spark, which is also how I made this presentation. You can do a page in Spark, you can do slides, you can do different things. Um, Adobe Spark is great because it, it's supported by, by the school in a way, um, Heather can, teach you about Adobe Spark. She's been coming in to teach my classes about um, Adobe Spark for the last couple of the semesters. But um, it lets you mix text, photos, video, audio, links in one seamless presentation. And um, you can use Canva, it's another free um, graphic presentation tool that you could do this with. What students told me in their comments under the poll was that the um, lessons that they learned the most, I gave my lessons all names, and the ones that they remembered the most were all these mixed graphic presentations. So I just wanna really quickly show you one here just so you can see what it looks like. This was my lecture on social listening, and you can see they go through and they read. I can make things bigger. I can make them lighter. I can put in photos. I can put in examples to show them what I was talking about. Um, uh, TweetDeck and Hootsuite. Um, you can embed videos that they can watch from right in here. You can embed audio. Um, I have embeds in here to links that tell them more about these things. So it's just, um, it's just a way to present information that's not just text, not just video, and it, it works for the students, they remember them. So I use VoiceThread, a lot of people have talked about VoiceThread. Um, I have to tell you that I had two students 
who were just violently opposed to Boy Scout. One was so opposed to it that he contacted me and asked me if I could just send him some notes on that presentation, because apparently in some class he had a horrible experience with voice thread and he just didn't want to do it. Um, but what, what it does do is, as you can put a video in there and then narrate parts of the video, or you can put slides in and put voice on each slide, and it does allow them to record questions at selected points, you can turn that on or off. So you can say, well, I wanna narrate this video at various points, but I don't wanna allow them to comment, or you can put it on. And a big plus is VoiceThread integrates with Blackboard. There are links that allow you to, uh, in, to go straight into uh, Blackboard. Now, I did want to just briefly say here before I move on to the next one, that my method of, setting up Blackboard is to embed all of my graphic things. I don't just put a link. And I do that because I try to give them a more visual look at what they're going to be doing. So if you, um, if you, if I go here to the last week of this semester, you can see that uh, I have, you know, some instructions in, but as you go down, I have embedded documents, graphics, videos, so they have a very visual look on Blackboard too. I think that draws them uh, in more. So uh, another thing I do, I did this semester, which you saw there on that Blackboard page is, just create a poster for them. I did this using Adobe Illustrator and I used a, um, a flowchart template that was already in there. So it really only took about 10 minutes to do. I did some screenshots, I put the text in, I would normally narrate on a video and, it, and they could get a, uh, to find these public disclosures, they could get a do this, it looks like this, do this, it looks like this. There's six steps here um, and Students told me that particularly as a review at the end of the semester, where at the end of the semester they had to do a project where they had to use all the skills they'd learned throughout. And I did this with some early, um, did some early video lectures and made them into posters and they told me it was a great review format. Um, so next, if I can get this to click, I have, sorry, sometimes, uh, sometimes Zoom loses the click thing. I wanted to talk about doing assignments in Google Docs. And this is really a way you could do a living assignment in an asynchronous environment. But if you look at this, it would also be a way you could do an in-classroom assignment socially distanced. Because if you have students in a room and you want them to work in groups, but you don't want them to be within six feet of each other, how do you make that work? Well, you can do it through using these Google Docs. And I'm gonna go here to one and show you. I blanked out their names, but otherwise you're gonna see the whole assignment from July 2nd. During the summer, what I did was I held a Zoom session for an hour each week where students who wanted to could go through this with me and do the assignment right then. But if you didn't want to do that Zoom or you couldn't, the instru instructions and texts were all on Blackboard and you could come to this document and see what other people did. And I had like a 36 hour deadline to do the work. So um, I just gave the instructions for the class activity. And then what I did at the bottom, let me see if I can go that far, is put in blank pages where it told them what to do. So I wanted them to give me their name and answer questions. They were looking for marketing reports. Um, so they had to answer questions throughout and then give me a screenshot. 
And then um, for the people who were on Zoom, we talked about each one before uh, they left Zoom. So they could not only see what they did right, but they could see what other people did right or, or wrong. <laughs> and then for students who couldn't be on Zoom, and this, would, this works for asynchronous, I put notes in and so you could actually, it's no grades. In fact, they didn't, they got points for doing this and um, they, didn't, they, they didn't get points if they didn't do it, right? So, um, so, you know, it was learning from each other like when you present things in class. You, and they, nobody's seen anybody's grade on here. But I could put notes, notes in to, to tell them, well, this is why this wasn't the best, the best piece of information. I did this in the spring for writing cut lines in my editing class, and everybody could look at the other people's cut lines and see, well, here's a different way to do this. You know, this is good, this is, this is bad. So it's, um, it's just a, a really good way of, um, of doing a, a living assignment um, when you're in an asynchronous environment. Then Doug talked about this, but I used Slack as a discussion board this summer. I tried using the Blackboard discussion board last spring because I figured, well, it's already there and students don't have to get anything new, but students didn't want to use the Blackboard dis discussion board because it's too clunky. And what they liked about Slack and what worked for them with Slack is that it's right in their wheelhouse. You can get this and put it on your phone. It's like texting. They could text me messages and I could see them right away. In fact, I have a student right now who's got an extension and she's texted me three messages while we've been online here. So the, the cool thing was that Students would text me and ask me about um, issues, ab about their assignments. They would ask me when they didn't understand something in a lecture. But I also got several of these people just chatting with me about things. One knew I was a sports fan. We talked sports. So I, I made a connection with him. Uh, one asked me about uh, an internship she's looking at for the spring and wanted some advice. So it worked really well. But what I did on the discussion board was I posted questions, if I can go back and find my question. And, um, and so like, here's a question I asked them about what journalists can, uh, how they can um, get more trust, how they can get people more to trust them. And if this was another check mark thing, if they answered, they got a check mark, and if they responded to someone else's, they got one extra point. So that that students like that, it was a way for them to get a couple of extra points. But Slack just worked so much better. And the beauty of that also is that in the communications field, so many people are going to get jobs where they go and they use Slack, so they might as well learn about it now. A couple of other ideas is um, there's a program called ThingLink that lets you annotate photos and then you get pop-up text, pop-up videos, whatever you want to put in there. So I, could, I can see, like, I've used ThingLink. I haven't used it for Blackboard yet, but I've used it for other things. I could see, like, if I'm teaching um, the, for instance, in print, the hierarchy of headlines and display text on page. I could put a picture of a print page and I could annotate each part with information about what that was and how it fits into the structure of the page. So it, it, particularly if you're teaching something very visual, ThingLink is great and it has a free option for teachers. Uh, games is great. I, I've done Jeopardy in my class. I have the Jeopardy template. Uh, I've done it for AP style quiz. And I did it for um, a grammar, um, grammar discussion and students love it because it's fun, especially if you're teaching synchronously, but you're teaching online. 
it's great. It's great actually inside of class too. I've done it um, in a in an in-person class. But I had two students this summer who created a game using Kahoot that was a review before the last assignment. And any I they did it. I edited it because they made a few mistakes. But then any student could take it, and that was. Uh, and ex the, the students could all pick an extra project if they wanted. And two students worked together, so it was group work, even though it was online. Um, and they did it. I didn't have to spend the time doing it. I only had to spend the time editing it. So it was great. And I also did polls. There are lots of easy ways to do polls. Slack has lots of poll extensions. You can use Google Forms to create a poll and you can do it. You can even do it where it's um, anonymous. If you make the poll a link through Blackboard and you set up the poll so that they don't have to give their name. And to prove they did it, the poll, um, you just have a second page where if, if you ask at the end of the Google Form, it will give you a finish page put a code on that page like A10502 and then have them put that code into Blackboard and it proves that they did the form. Um, and that, that worked out really well for a couple of minutes where I wanted them to discuss something, but I didn't necessarily think, I thought it was maybe something where they might not be totally, um, um, honest if everyone else could see their answer. The big thing here is you need to think about what presentation mode works best for your material because not all of these are going to work good for all material. For instance, the beauty of um, this, of using something like, um, I'm sorry, I just lost my Jerry, you are muted right now. We did that. Where did you lose, lose me? I was trying to click on the Spark page and, and the black uh, Zoom banner kept going through and I guess I clicked on mute. So the beauty of using Spark is that it generates a link and that link stays the same even if you edit it multiple times. I continually edited these things. Um, and if I added something new, I would let students know. But the beauty of this is if I wanted to use this in a future class, but it got dated, all I have to do is go in and edit it and then just click on update the link and that link stays the same. So you wanna think about, um, well, what might I want to do again? A regular video might be kind of difficult to, um, to continuously edit, but that Spark page is easy to, to keep it up to date. But not all material is gonna work great for that kind of a, a presentation. So think about what works best for your material. And part of the reason you want to do that is because you never can tell when this is going to happen, when we're going to end up back in our houses and the desks all be empty. So I just have my assessment, and I know you really can't read this, but the reason I wanted to put it in graphically was to show you that if you look at the colors, everybody really liked something and everybody really hated something and it wasn't all the same. And so you're never, this, what this tells you is one presentation isn't going to please your whole class. So unless you have some idea that there's something about your class that says, I can only do it this way. Like if your, um, your assessment of their uh, technology says, well, they have no bandwidth. Well, then you don't want to get big bandwidth. But if that's not the case, 
then mix it up a little bit and you're helping all of your different students. Okay, so that's it for me. There is a credit page. <laughs> I, I liked that um, that photo was a credit photo, but it looked exactly like that one room in Malat. I, I swear I was back in Malat there for a second. Y'all know what it reminds me about. of that. Uh, it, it also reminds me of the. Oh, I'm having brain freeze. What's the what's the chemistry building or the geology building? Yeah, that's the one I'm talking about. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, so one question that, that was asked, I think this is such a good question. I've heard we should use OneDrive rather than Google Docs, especially for graded assignments or other needs for private or potentially protected information. What are the benefits or preference to Google Docs over OneDrive? Well, that's a good question. I, had I have had a lot of students who have sent me um, drafts through OneDrive. Um, what I'm doing on Google Docs is sharing it so that it's editable only if you have that link. And um, once the semester is over, I go back to all of those and turn the sharing off. So they're only there for me. Now I put in one that's shared on my, uh, my handout, but I blacked out the students' names. And actually, the link on there is not editable. It's only viewable. But you can do in, in uh, Google Docs, um, this, you can see it, it's public all the time. You can see it if you have the link, or you can edit it if you have the link. And that's, that's how I do it. So unless you have that link, you can't do it. And I don't put any kind of grades or anything. So if you're going to assign any grades, you can't do that through Google Docs. And I really don't, like I said, I, my students use OneDrive for drafts, but I've never done an assignment like this in OneDrive. So um, I'm not 100% sure what the viewing is for other people, but I would assume it's only viewable by people at KU. But it, it is important, it's a good question because it's important to know. You can have Google Doc, but you can't put anything in there that would look like a grade. You can't say this is only gonna get part of the points even if you don't wanna put the points. You can just put comments. My Google Doc assignments are more like things where we would do things in class and, and I would give them feedback on whether they're doing it right. They're not so much, um, uh, you know, wow, this is 100% or this is 70% or something like that. Okay. Um, and then we had a lot of questions about whether you are presenting in Spark or not. And I knew the answer to that. So yes, <laughs> Barry did use Spark. And her content, the, everything she showed us is in that Google Drive folder as online tools to engage learners. So you can see that exact same. And I also popped into our chat the link to um, the Flex teaching site, then events, and Lisa will be leading a Spark lesson tomorrow. Um, and just as an FYI, my website, JSchool Tech, is going to get new Spark tutorials targeting students up um, hopefully, fingers crossed, before the end of the um, summer, so by fall. Um, here so, is a comment. I'm not, I'm going to mention this. Doug is saying that OneDrive is supported by KU and is FERPA compliant. That's uh, one benefit to using it, and then KU offers support for it. So that's kind of an answer there. Well, and the thing about my presentation, it was done with Spark. What I did was the presentation that's in your folder is about more than twice as long and has more links, um, et cetera. Then I made, I duplicated that and cut it way down for slides. You can present in Spark slides, but you can't publish those slides and share them. Um, when you publish it, it comes out as a scrollable page like that. But um, Spark also has other options. You can create videos in Spark and, and a lot of things. 
Um, well, I just want to thank, and we're going to kind of hang out here um, in case there's extra questions. So feel free to unmute yourself and ask. But I just want to thank everyone for coming today and really coming to all three of our sessions. Um, thank you so much. And thank you for spending part of your summer with us. And we'll hang out and answer any final questions, comments. And other than that, enjoy your summer. Okay. Sorry, I got booted from Zoom there for a minute. I did just want to say that the uh, the Spark workshop that uh, we're doing tomorrow is basically how to make a banner image or how to do like a one page syllabus highlights doc. And then in two weeks from tomorrow, we're going to be talking about how to use Spark for assignments, kind of like what Jerry was talking about. Um, you know, how to how to have your students use it to, um, you know, do something a little bit more multimedia um, and make it a little bit more engaging. Yeah, I had uh, in, in my class, and, and Peter knows this because we did the same thing last spring in, um, in J302. Um, students had the option for their extra assignment, like one student, I said two students made a, a game, but they could also take their text paper and turn it into a Spark presentation. And um, students really liked doing that, and I think part of what it did was show them that when you think about so much of your life is going to be about the web when you get out there working when you think about the web you have to think in a more graphic way and i there was also a lot of comments mainly from j school people who are like i love spark so i'm so excited i've converted you all like <laughs> <laughs> How do you spot a J, J school person? They're using Spark somewhere in their teaching. Okay, no questions. So yeah, I, we will be recording. I, yeah. I, I yes. do have a question. I'm sorry, I didn't know it was time to talk. No, okay. no. Um, <laughs> okay, so um well, I have a, I'm, I'm faculty support, so I do a lot of assisting um, with Blackboard, and I have a professor, I have two questions. One has a couple of assignments that she wants to set up so students can more easily complete them online. The assignment, it gives the student a hypo to answer, and then they're supposed to compare their answer to her sem sample in, in a self-assessment -ass type of assignment. In the past, this is something that would just be handed out in a hard copy, and they could fill it out and hand it back in, um, and then sometimes she'd post an electronic copy, and students could complete it some way online. Um, with this virtual world that we're living in, we're trying to figure out, is there a best, is test, just a test the best way we think we should do that in Blackboard? Or is there another way? This is, I think, where you might want to use that adaptive release. You might want to have basically a two-part assignment. Part one is they do, they do their own reaction or their write-up or whatever it is. Mm -hmm. Once they file that, then boom, the second part opens up uh, because you have the second part on the adaptive release that student has at least one attempt for whatever the assignment is. So, and you give them only one attempt, and so then they've submitted that, and then. Um, you know, tell them to save it or whatever, or I guess they can go back and look at it. I don't know if there's a way to like kick their answer over into the next assignment. I doubt it. Um, but yeah, so then you can sort of say, okay, you know, thinking back to what you just did, here's, here's another answer to it. How does yours compare with this? Blah, blah, blah. You know, it may be easier to do it in Blackboard with a two-part assignment with adaptive release there. Okay. Okay. I'll, um, I'll, I'll give that a, 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 we have a test. We're working on a test. So I'll do that. My next question is, I don't know if anybody's ever used something like a uh, top hat. And then, um, so she wants to do, um, this is completely different. She wants to do, oh, let me see here. I'm trying to get her specific words. Um, okay. So, she wants because I, I was telling her hey you know maybe we can use teams for for something like this and so um she is going to use teams but she liked a, to draft a poll with questions and our options in advance and they either, and either embed them in the slides and have them immediately pop up the results on the screen or have it set up somehow via separate website like poll anywhere um and i'm or maybe even teams um, so she's logged. So it's kind of almost an op, an alternate to the eye clicker. She doesn't want to have the expense of 
having them pay for their own eye clicker. Um, so she wants to be logged in into class where she can share the screen with the results there. And I think this is something that she's kind of trying to, th she's thinking about it live, not necessarily like Zoom poll. Um, so is she, I think she's thinking of a live scenario. Uh, well, if you use a Google form to set up a poll like I did, um, which, you know, when you go into Google Forms, it'll ask you to do name and email and stuff, but you can delete those and just start with, it looks like a, a, a test, but you're clicking things and then it generates a poll. The results I had at the end are a poll. And Google Forms constantly will update as people put in results. So you can see those. Um, and if you embedded that into a presentation like Spark Page, where you could see, I could easily click on a link and, and go you know, to a poll, or sometimes in Spark, you can actually see you know, like a video or something runs right in it, then the form would, would constantly give you updated um, results. Now, that, I, that's probably the lowest tech way of doing it. I'm sure there are programs that will do that all for you, but that has the benefit of being all free. You know, that if you're, if you're trying to get around buying something like Top Hat, that would be a way to do it. I can't hear you on the other go. It, Top Hat's not free. Um, it isn't really expensive, but it isn't free. But their their live poll is pretty cool. I mean, you can have it be multiple choice, so you can have words just kind of flowing on the screen if you're doing it live. Um, it does work really well if you've got a bigger class, um, but it isn't free. So right, I don't know right. if it's as expensive as the clicker. When I used it last, it was not this past spring, but the spring before. It was I think it was twenty six dollars a semester per student, and that fee went for like every class they had that used Top Hat. Mm -hmm. So if they happened to be using it in more than one class, it really was not expensive. Um, but I figured, well, I wasn't actually making them buy a textbook, so I could make them buy that. <laughs> right. Well, um, and we, di we discussed that. And then we also, she, I guess she found poll everywhere. And so I have to do some research on poll everywhere. But she wants something that can be used if anybody was at home. Um, you know, if the, the synchronous and if it was in person and half synchronous online, um, she does have a big class. Um, so it could be like 70 some people and um, she doesn't want to have to upload her slides or anything to the, plat the polling platform itself. She just wants to deploy the questions. So um, I think well, maybe we'll, we'll go Slack ahead. Slack also has a lot of, um, you know, you can add uh, plugins to Slack and there are gobs of poll plugins on Slack, but then of course you're going from Blackboard to Slack to do your poll, but you wouldn't have to put anything in but the poll. Honestly, a live Twitter poll might be just the easiest, but then, you know, then they're all getting their phones out to get on Twitter. Um, well, that, I think they're going to have to have their phones out to a certain yeah. extent because how are they, I think they're going to, I think we assume that there's going to have to be some feature like their phone. Yeah. And Yolanda, this might be a really good question if you have not already taken taken this to the Center for Online and Distance Learning. This might be a good question for them. What are professors who used to use Top Hat using now? So I would I would say that might be a good place to go. Okay, where where should I send it? Uh, the Center for Online and Distance Learning, C O D L, and they're kind of our. Them along with um, Center for Teaching Excellence are really our experts um, on campus for these things, but they might, I would guess that they've encountered this question before. Okay, thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. All right, well, I think we're gonna go ahead and wrap up. Again, thanks for all of your time. Thanks to my speakers. I am always so happy that I have such talented and wonderful colleagues and, and volunteered. So thank you so much. Have a great one, everyone. Bye-bye.